everybody. Ooh. I was just tripping over this little cloth because we found out there was reflection in the screen and we don't want that with art. My name is uh, Lars Boering. Welcome, everybody in the room. This is the third edition of uh, the, our series about visual storytelling. And today we will talk about the state of art, arts makers, arts galleries, computers, photography, NFTs. I, when we were making this uh, program, we, uh, we felt uh, the best title for the evening would probably be Let's Get a Little Bit Lost. Um, but maybe we'll also find some answers. We have a very special guest here in the room tonight, uh, Dutch visual artist Jan Robert Leegte, Russian-American photographer Alexei Yurenev, photographer, but yeah, traditional uh, description, but look at his work. Natasha Greenalg, co-founder and creative director of the Next Museum. Karen Archie, curator of the contemporary art at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. My name is Lars Boering. I'm fascinated by storytelling. I'm also director of the European Journalism Center. Journalism is one way of storytelling, but I'm also interested in photography, art, but storytelling in general. Um, today's maker doesn't feel restricted uh, by the limits of her, his, their medium. The maker is really a maker, a photographer who films, the filmmaker who has a podcast, the writer who has a vlog. The story determines the medium and in the visual storytelling series, we investigate the expanding universe of visual storytelling. And today's episode, we will dive into the world of post-internet art. How do artists currently use the internet and the latest digital means, uh, techniques? What opportunities do digital galleries? What is NFT? Anybody know what an NFT is? Anybody that doesn't know what an NFT is? We're not going to explain because we will run out of time. Uh, maybe we'll figure it out today. Um, but what does it uh, offer in this artistic field and, and entrepreneurship suddenly with NFT? Here, I'm going to give it to you. You can become a millionaire with NFT. Um, but what is it worth later on? And who is owning it? And who stores it? Anyway, um, yeah, how are these new generations or newcomers uh, challenge power structures in the art scene and society? Let's get lost. Um, reflecting on the digital and offline realms. Post-internet art is no longer solely using the internet as a canvas, like net art did. Anybody knows net art? Yeah, we'll figure it out. We get lost. Uh, Computer-generated art, visual musea, art in vir virtual musea, art in your pocket. Uh, it, in it exists in both worlds. Uh, the metaverse, anybody know what the metaverse is? No? Good. Good for you. Um, I, I, I think I have an idea about it, but also today we will, might find some answers to it. What is real? That's the, word, the question we keep asking. So welcome to you all. We have a lot of speakers, so let's get on. Um, let me ask to the stage uh, Robert Jan, Jan Robert Leegte. Please come to the stage. Where are you? Are? There you are. One of the first Dutch artists to work on and for the internet since 1990s, shifted his main focus to implementing digital materials in the context of physical gallery space. You are represented by Upstream Gallery, which is a real gallery, um, of course, um, to bridge the online world with the gallery artwork, making prints, sculptures, websites, software, NFTs, installations, drawings, and projections. I'm gonna give you the floor before I make everybody more confused than, uh, than, than, I, uh, than you will explain to us. Um, take it away, please. Thanks so much. Just jack in this little thing. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay. <coughs> Frog. Um, Okay, just, I, I kind of like the real thing, because that, that sort of is a very nice a little story I want to tell about here. Um, I don't use software to make art. I make art about software. That would be a way to sort of enter my field of work I make. Uh, we generally see software as some sort of tooly 
universe with which you make stuff. Um, and I'm very much interested in the tools themselves and um, um, specifically, so what they are made of and what they, <clears throat> what they are to us. I'm a bit echoey, I think. Um, and since the very first internet studies I made, and I started in 97, <clears throat> I, um, net art, I was making net art back then, web-based art. Um, I was very much captivated by this, the experience of the screen and the experience of software. Um, and from that point, I sort of very much approached it as a sort of phenomenological way to sort of um, to grasp the, the ontolog ontological nature of software. So what is it really? What is, how do I relate to it? What, what is it fundamentally? Because I found it to be something completely different than anything we'd, we'd sort of worked with before. So a radical break with media before. And when you deal with stuff on a phenomenological way, you can get quite lost, actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, the sort of this perceptive sort of this, this entity in front of you it can be highly weird. And um, because it was such a new space and there wasn't that much sort of knowledge in the 90s um, available, uh, and from a passion for art history, I chose that to be my anchor. So I always use art history as a, as a sort of sort of this, this anchoring point to work with this. And I use its disciplines, its methods, art, art pieces of art, um, the language as a sort of um, a tool to dissect this, this weird new landscape of the computer. Um, and that works out, sort of what I often do is by, I, by throwing something at a, a work I made, at a software-based work maybe, like performance art or sculpture or impressionism or Yves Klein painting or whatever, um, like with a uh, particle accelerator, they smash together and and they never overlap. So some, some stuff breaks off and some stuff sticks. And that's, that's where it becomes interesting. And, you, and that's how you learn. You sort of get to know this, this nature of software. For, for what is it? Is it, is it a performative stage? Is it, is it something sculptural? Is it, is it, is it a canvas? Is it, uh, is it conceptual art? I mean, there's so many questions you can ask it. And, and they, won't, they all don't fit. Nothing fits. But, there's always parts of that fit. That's, that's the sort of the way I love to work. You, you can see my work as a sort of contemplation on the experience of software. Um, so it's best that you can read it, not so much as content, but more as an expression of the materiality of the various aspects of software. Um, I've always loved to code myself. I find that a very, um, a very healthy way for me to find a subtle poetry within this material. And I've really sort of, that's been ways I otherwise would have never found the stuff I engage with. And as you heard, it's not so much that I am like a computer artist, it's very much about the software and resulting in working in all kinds of media. And it could be anything, as, as, as we just heard, I also make drawings or prints or sculptures. It's uh, once I've sort of, once I've found this little nugget, I can, I'll just, express it in whatever media it needs to be. So much for the introduction. Um, what you see here is uh, a software interface. Very abstract, um, very nostalgic, going back to the 90s. And it's called Window, and it's part of a NFT series of generative pieces, um, which I released this March. And um, this work is very much I found engaging with the NFT world highly amazing, but also really confusing. And as with anything brand new, it's sort of trying to sort of took away my, my way of working to approach it again. So it's very much looking at what, what is this new stuff? And what I found at first, I remember thinking what commodifying something fluid doesn't make sense. It's, 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 it's sort of ontologically, it doesn't make sense. But that's the beauty of software. Software can just manifest as whatever you like. It, it, it sort of, there's these shells and shells. And um, looking back at 
sort of the works I was making in the 90s, which were about these, these interfaces, um, I was, was fascinated by these, um, these, these, these uh, sort of the software interface of the 90s, which sort of um, reminded me of the stone carved petroglyphs, sort of ancient, ancient techniques um, that sort of echo back to the first step to making art of humans. And this sort of illusion of tactility um, always reminded me of sort of form of sculpture. And then realizing that the programming language of Ethereum, one of the, one of the blockchains in which a lot of NFT, NFTs are produced, is called Solidity, um, made a lot of sense. Because the blockchain is software, but it behaves and feels like hardware. And that's, just, that's kind of the sort of the unique selling point of the blockchain. And it's something really weird. So you have this, this programmatic performance, yeah, this fluid performance of something really solid. And that's the success of it. And realizing that, I thought, oh, that's so it's funny. These two points, um, sort of this, this mimicking sculpture on your screen and mimicking, again, the solidity, again, sort of form of sculptural objects within the internet seems to be this, this hunger we have as human beings to, to sort of this, sort of our brainstem just needs to sort of solidify stuff, can't handle this, this continuous flux and fluidity, and um, we feel at home. It's in some ways, it's nearly sort of a natural feeling, and it, I, I sort of tribute to this piece to being sort of um, witnessing the progressing poem, language, the pro progressing performance of permanence. So it's, and you can imagine that, sort of with the metaverse we're talking about, everything, and then we're just mimicking and make solidifying and rebuilding our world. And it makes, it makes us calm in, in sort of face with all the, the violence behind the screen, because it is a very different world. Um, this piece, um, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, complicated, but what you, it, it's generative, that means uh, there's the whole series, everyone is unique. Um, um, as I said, they echo sort of a time of net art in the 90s, which I found out a lot of parallels with sort of the time now, um, with a few different keys. I mean, there's a whole low bandwidth thing, there's this anonymity, there's this west, sort of this wild west frontier feeling, there's this idealism going on. Um, I would say the sort of naive idealism, which we, of course, experienced back in the 90s. Um, and um, I'll skip to the next one. It's, there's a little too much. Um, here's another one. Here you can see them. They are actually interactive. Um, what I kind of liked is that I used the, uh, the what is it, the responsiveness of software as, as a sort of material quality. So where usually everything scales, this work sort of reveals its details when, when changed in size. That means also this work in the future when the resolutions go up, it will just, it will deliver more and more detail. So it's, it's a work that can grow in time. Um, it comes in a, in a few colors. It's called, it comes in Vukosic green after one of the net art pioneers from the 90s, Robert Flood Black, uh, the predecessor of Malevich in the 17th century, the Theo von Duisburg yellow, Hilma Afklint red, hyperlink blue, interface silver, and document white. So very basic colors, of course, bringing in um, 20th century modernism, but also sort of functional colors of, of the interface. Um, this is the, so the latest thing I'm showing now. So now we're jumping back to one of my earliest works. It's from 2000. And this is an actual bit of net art. And what you see here is a composition in the browser of operating system elements. So these are actual scroll bars, and they are animating. So these are like, like little operating system elements. And this work, again, is sort of very much about the materiality of software. Because it's, it, the work operates as a mirror. The work has been up now for 22 years. And over time, it shape shifts. It, it transforms. So the, 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 the uh, visual aspect changes due to the changing nature of the network computer. Um, and therefore functions as a mirror. 
and I have no idea what it will look like in the future, and um, I had no idea what it would look like when I made it. But I think that is a very essential part of working with digital material, that you uh, embrace this sort of fluid, fluid aspect of it. Um, another work sort of talking about the phenomenology and the, trying to understand the nature of, of the machine is this piece called In the Blink of an Eye. In, in the Blink of an Eye is a series of prints which try to capture the temporal differences between your, your personal, your, your body time versus the machine time. And what you see here is, for instance, um, an iPhone 6 um, counting, simply counting uh, during the moment you're, you blink with an eye. So I, I, I run that down to blinking an eye as a tenth of a second and instructed the computer to count, or the iPhone to count, resulting in this insane iteration of numbers going up to about 900,000. Uh, barely, barely readable and barely sort of uh, capturable in the space. This is an iPhone 6. If you would do it with this computer, I probably need a warehouse. So this is this accelerating um, force going on. And it's, I think it's something you, of course, never realize and never work with. So you're basically liking the cat movie uh, within this interface you never look at. And behind the screen, there's this insane temporal difference. And I, th I think that is fascinating because this, this, that, that is part of the materiality of the machine. If you, if you start understanding that, you also can sort of understand that everything you do experience on this screen is this extreme high-paced performance of data constantly. Um, I'll go to the last one. The last one is ornament. An ornament is another NFT project I did in November. And um, ornament is sort of, again, is a, a procedural project. I try to do it as clean and elegant as possible that I, this is completely on chain, as they call it. There's a lot of words you probably can forget later. Um, that means that within the NFT token, the work is stored intrinsically. So there's no links, nothing involved. Uh, and they will stay like combined forever. The blockchain is up. Um, these, are, these are basically all different ornaments generated um, in this series. And um, I can read a little text which I wrote about this, um, relating it back to sort of traditional architecture. Um, spread along the Austrian, Italian, and Swiss mountain villages in the various Alpine cultures, you will find a specific ornamental technique called sgraffito. First one would darken the cement covering the stone outer walls with pigment. Then one would apply a layer of crisp white chalk paint. While still wet, the craftsperson would scratch away parts of the paint, revealing the darker underlayer. This duotone technique was used to add ornamental depictions on walls. Often, Scraffita would mimic carved masonry by highlighting two sides of a rectangle and adding shadows to the other ones, creating the optic illusion of them popping out of the wall. I have always wondered about the aesthetics of traditional Alpine culture. The bright red geraniums, nice carvings, floral embroidery, dirndls, etc. Even the high altitude flowers are tiny, delicate, and bright in color. Maybe it's a way to relate to the brute wilderness and inhumaneness of the high mountains a way to enchant their threatening presence by throwing prettiness at them. By putting the ornament on center stage, in a way, I'm also trying to tame the abysmal depth of computational reality. That's it. <laughs> Please stay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I have some questions to ask. Yeah. Bring them on. From the distance. <laughs> um, we talked about getting lost, and we talked about what what is there and where is the control, and how how do you well, how do you not get lost in all these opportunities? Because the the backside of what you described behind this screen of the the iPhone six or whatever device, there's so much going on. Where where how how do you navigate that? Where do you draw this line? Or uh, yeah, I, I, that is exactly why because it. 
approaching things in a phenomenological way are always kind of, they're, they're very, what is it? Um, you, you get into thin air very fast. It's not like if you would just stare at a tree for a long time and let it dissolve into, and really get into the grains and you let go of your notions. Um, that is a thin air. So you need, you need a sort of structure. And, and as I said, I really use art history for that. I think because it's, um, art is a, it, it can be a field to lose oneself in quickly, um, and especially with this new medium. Right. There wasn't that much reference, and then you also saw that sort of, this sort of, um, a lot of repetition of previous, um, it's like YouTube videos, performing videos. I mean, there's a lot of sort of mimicry of existing media going on, so if you really want to get into touch with the machine, um, I thought it, was, I thought it was useful to look at art history and just take conceptual art or minimalism or land art or specific artists and just see how they match works I make. Yeah. And it, it is very helpful. Do you feel that you are in control or is this controlling you or is there sort of a balance that you try to find? Um, no, I, I, have my, I have my narrative and uh, that also becomes your... Your, your building, of course, and I revisit stuff many times. So, as you see, sort of over decades, I will revisit topics and see how they work in different contexts and different technologies and different media. And um, now it works for me. I, I, I looked at your presentation, and uh, and and one of them is the, the 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 browser and these changes, and we don't know where it's going to end up. The other one was that you you showed the the, the result is hanging on the wall. Uh, which is a more, yeah, I don't know, is that traditional uh, or not? I mean, it's still uh, lots of things hang on the wall. Um, yeah, is that, yeah, is that for you to translate it into a form that you could sell, or because you also you are also involved in 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 selling digital? Yeah, well, these works. Uh, yeah, um, quite literally. Um, the work I showed you, the the blink of an eye, is literally has to be on the wall because it, it's about bodily proportions and size and it's, it's manifesting the inside of the machine so it has to come into your space. Yeah. So that was, uh, there was no other way you couldn't show it on a screen. Um, works like this function fantastically on screen. First of all, they're responsive, they're very much made within the material constraints of the screen. Uh, like the other piece as well, it's responsive and whatever you look at on it, it'll, it'll work. And and like with net art as well, um, of course, the piece I showed, the scroll bar composition, well, um, you can ask Karen, but it's always really hard to show these pieces in spaces. Yeah. And I've always been. It's, it's always, they, they really work the best on your own laptop, in your bed, or in your, just in the private space of the computer. That's where they were created, and that's where they're on the, always they're on the best. Yeah. So if you want to show them in space, you have to translate. You have to sort of make an adaptation or a next version or something like that. Yeah. Um, but the, those both domains are fine. I mean, that wasn't fine for a long time. So when I started making net art, then nobody cared less. And, uh, um, and now there's more acceptation. I mean, this, and this, this whole wave of NFTs has created a whole new group of collectors who are very happy to have things solely in the digital domain and they're very they're content with that. So it, it's, it's nice, it gives you an extra it gives you this native space where a digital entity can be and stay, which, which is great. So it, it, this kind of responsive work doesn't make any sense in, in a space. NFT, non-fungible -fung token, owning a digital... Work. Work. Yep. Uh, yeah, you have it, and, but it doesn't have to be shown or it can, yeah, it's, it's somewhere, but you own it. Um, I mean, this this is this is a strange new territory, right? This is like the what's next in the in in maybe in the market or not? How well, do you not, see it? not completely because um, there's a long history of that. I mean, even, even collecting video art had its quirks. Um, net art, the same sort of. Uh, there's a lot of collectors over time who have been buying or collecting internet art pieces, which exist solely under a domain name, and um, yeah, that's always had a lot of questions about that, but this is not that different. Mm -hmm. um, so having work 
live on the internet, I think web-based art has always been, uh, has been the predecessor of that. Mm -hmm. And in a way you could see sort of, um, I think like Raphael Rose now mentioned, like sort of trapping them in a frame with a domain name was a way of commodifying this and yeah. was also relatively successful. Um, and I've had collectors, big collectors who bought their first web art and were extremely happy about it to have something in the public space, yet be sort of um, have ownership or uh, patronage ship. Yeah. Um, but they were like very relieved to finally be able to show what they love so much, yeah. which is a, it's also a sort of a liberating aspect of it. These things develop and, uh, and NFT came and, and suddenly there's a new space to, to, to make the art visible or live. Or, um, are, you, are, you work, are you always thinking about what comes next or do you also, I mean, you must be at the forefront of these new developments or is that just like I am just following it and a little bit surprised every once in then that something comes up? Mm, I wasn't that early. I did it in November, and there's other artists who were doing it before that, uh, and way before even. Um, so, yeah, I was I was there just after the big hype, um, and it took yeah, but that specifically about this. I mean, with, sorry, with with web-based art, it was nice and ni nice and early, but uh, with this, yeah, early it's all, it's all not that important, but. Um, uh, yeah, of course. Working digitally, you, you're always interested in these shifting possibilities. I would say it's a very exciting field to work in because um, there's not that many of us doing sort of intrinsic or intrinsically digital art. Mm -hmm. And the field is massive. I mean, it's culturally so completely huge and important that you would expect so much more people to do it. And it constantly is just sprinting ahead. So you're always, there's always open space and it's moving. So there's a lot of work to do. Imagine you're a curator trying to catch <laughs> up with this. Uh, I will ask you back later on. Sure. Uh, thanks for this presentation and this short Q&A and uh, we'll come back and see how we can bring all these pieces together. Let's do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, so we've been yeah, open for two years now and we focus on predominantly large-scale immersive installations or using um, emerging technologies. And for us, the really important focus is to commission new artworks um, and really work with new creators um, spanning a, quite a broad audience from visual art to sound to programming, performance, dance, um, yeah, quite a collective range. So that was a s short snippet of the first exhibition uh, called Shifting Proximities, which has just finished. And now we have a few of the new works that are part of the new exhibition that is opening on the 11th of June, which is going to be diving very much into some of the topics we've been kind of starting to touch on um, in terms of what is this fluid, crazy digital world that we're kind of... I feel start, it's starting to infiltrate more and more of the lives of the general public from NFTs. This, for example, is an NFT artist called Ocean. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but I think he's 22, based in LA, and he creates these totally psychedelic, bombastic, absolutely mental game environments, um, basically where him and loads of his friends started to come together during the pandemic as a way to still meet and, and connect in the metaverse, <laughs> the godforsaken word of the metaverse, but that's where the young kids are, um, and many other, not just young kids. Um, and then we also have the work of the likes of um, Jacoby Silverway, who is, um, yeah, a, an American voguing artist, um, along with many other things, who's created these very complex, sensual CGI worlds based on the original drawings of his schizophrenic mother, who was totally indoctrinated by all of the um, adverts that she was watching on TV, and then she was became obsessed with all these found objects um, that she thought that she was buying into on the TV. Um, so he's then from that started to create these, yeah, um, crazy, yeah, CGI worlds very much as a means to deal with the trauma of his mother and to process um, the exclusion that he faced um, as a black um, queer man in America. Um, we can kind of go through some of them faster, but ultimately the, the new exhibition is called UFO, which is Unidentified Fluid Other. And what we're looking at in the exhibition is um, who are we becoming in these virtual worlds? What does it mean to be developing um, post-human identities? What does this say about our culture? Um, what does it mean for where we are today and maybe where we are going? Um, and how are these different artists um, exploring um, new iterations of self or how are they using digital tools and means to um, deal with the current traumas, for example, people face in the pandemic um, and find new means of self-expression. And again, back to the dreaded word of the metaverse or anything online, I think it was also just mentioned in the previous talk, in the digital sphere, it's arguably way more fluid. It's undefined, it's organic. You could say it's undefined. I mean, this is what we also question, how undefined is it? How free really are we still in the, in the virtual and digital spheres? Um, there's a notion and an idea that um, you can reinvent anything, any way that you want and break norms and social values. Mm. Um, but I would question, can we really? How much, how far can we really take that? Mm -hmm. Because who's owning the technologies? Who's twisting the stories? So we're very much looking at the creative exploration of these digital artists, but also many of the stories that they're telling are not just pink bubblegum. Wow, look at us, we can re-express ourselves in different ways it's also very much challenging the suppression that people face through the technologies of what's happening in the physical world. Mm. Your, um, your take on the metaverse is, I mean, the metaverse is a very commercial thought. Yeah, but yeah it is, right? We, uh, we're, we're try, they try to lure us into the metaverse that they say the metaverse is maybe something like that. Uh, but you, do you see it that way? Or do you see that this, this blending of reality and these different universes uh, are already there? Or, yeah, where do we go? Um, it depends on the definition that someone is using as the metaverse. Like you said, in the, I think the last year and a half, there has become 
a definition that's more linked to a sci-fi movie that was made or the book. Um, and for me, that is a much more commercial or almost kind of Hollywood macho take on the term metaverse. And the idea of that is it's an always on digital layer on your everyday life. Um, I don't personally think it needs to be as prescribed as that. For me, it's the fusion of different realities, be that digital and physical or metaphysical. And I personally think we're already living in a version of the metaverse. I walk down the street and I'm thinking about how I may be going to communicate something online or how I'm going to tell a particular story or receive a different story or interact online and how that interaction that's maybe happening in the virtual sphere is then going to come in and connect with my physical interaction that's happening now or later today. So I'm already thinking across different uh, physical digital planes and to me that is a version of the metaverse personally. Do we, do we realize that? I mean, you describe it very clear and it, yeah, it really gives me a clear image. Yeah, exactly. I also do the same. And, and, uh, I'm I totally indoctrinated by yeah. how, how I... But everybody seems to be. I mean, yeah, yeah. people walk the... Yeah, what used to be called the phone is now the screen and sort of the way to look up things, connect with things. We are already there. Yeah. yeah. But then still, you created a space here in Amsterdam North um, what is what is the audience? Uh, I mean, we have opened up after the closure of the, after the pandemic. Um, who is coming there, and what does it do to them? Because you must be sometimes walking around there and see what the audience is doing with this. It's a huge mix. Um, I think we're seventy eight percent young people, um, which is under the age of twenty four, which we were actually really shocked by. Um, but that's also really exciting because it's showing a huge audience that previously weren't going to museums are coming in. And that's opening up a lot of really interesting conversations and programs with other museums about how we can then pair up together because we're attracting a young audience that a lot of museums have been really struggling to get in. Um, so there's a, there's a very big young audience, but the audience is super broad from um, people who are super focused on the more technical aspect of the work, the programming, the research, the scientific research that's going into some of the pieces, for example, those that are into more music production, because audio and music production is a huge part, um, to those that want to come and purely just be immersed, um, and those that are interested in the more curatorial rigour of some of the work. So it's quite a broad spectrum. Yeah. Karen, uh, before we later on look at some of the, the, the projects, the works that you show and that you give to us as an audience. Do you have a, do you have a distinct uh, description for yourself for metaverse? Or yeah, I was just wondering about that actually. What does that mean? Um, I actually thought it meant that all of the companies owned by Facebook because it transfer, transformed into meta, right? Right. Or what is what is the definition? There you go, metaverse. Yeah, so meta. Yeah, this is where you well, can see. maybe maybe they, they coined did. it meta. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, metaverse, uh, a, a a a reality beyond our own physical space, somewhere out there, uh, multiple places. It seems multiple layers. Uh, you can you can be uh, you can be Karen on the metaverse, but you can also totally look different there. If you want to, you can have three Karens uh, living there. You can, you can be uh, anything there. So yeah, th that is that is what the metaverse. It Meta is a company, but the metaverse is a yeah. A, a, I mean, this a, is a, an idea a, a that universe. we've been talking about since the '90s. There's like these comics of like a like a cat on the or like a dog on a computer mm -hmm. flirting with a cat and saying that like my tail is so long. You know, it's that's kind yeah. of a known. So this uh, leads me to the next question that uh, if you do not uh, uh, do not have a distinct view on the metaverse, for you it seems then that you are much more into what we are here, the, re yeah, the reality, whatever that is, showing works to an audience in the here and now, which is, for instance, performance art. You have to experience it on the spot. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, like during the pandemic, of course, there were a lot of like online programs, um, indeed, of performance that was documented and then, uh, you know, kind of shown online, which 
I think is not always the most popular way to experience performance. Mm -hmm. um, you, you would prefer, do you ever ask, uh, do, do people, what was the reaction for people to, to have to experience it online? Or when you, when you did a performance live and they could be there, would they say, I'm so happy that I can really observe it on my own? Or do you, do you know what that audience does? I mean, it really depends on the performance. Um, for example, this work by Alex Petrinsky Jenkins that's on the uh, screen that's very uh, physical, like you can hear the uh, performers rollerblading and the, the sound of the wheels on the floor. And there are two uh, performers who are kind of circling around each other like a pendulum reciting poetry to each other and it's about cruising. And the choreographer actually was on the beach in I think Greece and um, had seen this, this kind of like cruising on rollerblades scenario and, and created this choreography in response to that and to just be able to hear the, the breath of the, the, the performer and the kind of utterances of poetry, you have to really be there. So it's a very visceral performance. Um, you know, there was another performance that we did which is not in the slides, sorry, but um, it's, uh, performance by um, two choreographers who had just kind of imagined a membrane between um, online and offline space. Um, similarly, uh, Michele Rizzo, this is a work that we presented in 2018, 2019. Um, you can actually play that. But so this was uh, in the state looks on Trey Hall. And this is a piece that actually really uh, um, traveled through Instagram. So it started very small, like maybe 50 people came to the first performance and then they were posting about it on Instagram and then 100 people came and then we had to switch rooms and then it um, grew into the entree hall of the state of Lake and about four, four to 600 people came per performance and there were about 18 total. Um, and this is also about kind of generating community and coming together. This is by a queer uh, choreographer um, thinking about actually a really specific type of dance that was happening in gay clubs in Amsterdam in around 2013, 2014 called the Koninintanz. Yes. <laughs> so you can recognize it when you see the key movement um, that it's kind of based on the shuffle. Um, I thought I would also just zoom back a little bit and explain why we're talking about performance um, because my role um, when I came to the stage like, is curator of time-based media. Uh, this is, yeah, you'll see the key movement coming up. Um, but so time-based media is all artwork that has a duration. So that can be slides or ideas in Dutch, uh, video art, performance, um, you know, internet art, media art, um, sound. So it's, for me, it's always been a really interesting venture to document this work, bring it into a collection. Um, Mikela's work we actually collected from the municipal art acquisitions in 2018. And um, that's been a really interesting uh, venture. How do, you, how do you collect a performance like that? And we're actually, um, I guess, the secret, yeah, we're, we're presenting it again for the jubileum of the, uh, Bad Kaup, the uh, yeah. new building of the state of like in September. Does that, does it, uh, yeah, my question, does the artist uh, still need the museum? I mean, if you're, you just explained how that works together, right? You find them that the audience come in. The, yeah, what is the role of the museum in this? Well, when an artist passes away, oftentimes they won't have some sort of robust estate that takes care of their work. Um, you know, in terms of Michele's work, there's a very, very specific, you know, it looks, this choreography looks very simple, but the amount of movement and variables included in it are actually, it's, it's, it's enormous. It's a very, very nuanced piece. And you can't just watch this video and learn how to present it. Like you have to have someone embody that knowledge and pass it on to other people and make plans. And, you know, there's also materially a lot of rules about where you can perform it, the costuming that you can use and things like that. So the artist does need someone to help document what those rules are, the conditions are, 
Um, and if he were to pass away, we've done that. We have these workshops, we have video tutorials, we have an essay, um, we have 15 to 20 hours of conversations recorded. Um, so yeah, in, in some senses, certainly. And then in some senses, if you think of someone like Isaac Julian, who's a British artist working with photography, film and video, um, he has the best archive of anyone I've seen in the world. And, you know, he has assistants in a very uh, kind of thorough studio practice where um, he's always going to be the own expert on his work and will be able to probably, you know, set up an estate that um, takes care of his work in a way that's very sufficient. Yeah, this, this uh, video, if we would continue, Blades, I think it's 40 minutes, Yeah, something like that. So you have to see it when it, so it's, it, you said it's coming back, right? September, right. 20 something. Yeah. Um, do you, if, if you talk about uh, uh, having set these rules and talk about where it should be, I mean, do you feel, are you co-creating then? Do you, is there influence from, from you on the artist there? Is this this discussion, does this lead to a adaptation sometimes? Well, I'm caring, you know, like I'm in a very like caring position, a facilitating position. Right. But I'm very conscious of also like ever giving advice on pricing or um, sometimes I will give advice on auditioning and thinking through things like registration. But in terms of, I mean, I, I give advice if I'm asked for it, but I'm very, very careful about yeah. that. Do you sometimes uh, encounter art where you're like, how are we going to do this? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, all the time. All the yeah. time, yeah? I mean, we bought a, like, Chrome extension. I mean, with NFTs also, that's something I was just in, quoted in the paper about that. Um, yeah. Somebody, somebody in the museum says, where did you leave the <laughs> NFTs, Karen? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I was just talking to uh, um, Jan Robert earlier um, about NFTs and all the complexities around them and what it means to collect them and... You know, for certain museums, there will be a number of years that you say, okay, I can't, know I can preserve this work for 50 years. Um, you know, I think MoMA has a, a idea of at least 100 years. Um, you know, the state, like, we actually don't have a really specific policy on that, but when I collect a work, I, I want to know that for the foreseeable future, I know how I can care for it. Yeah. And that's just not really the case with our time-based media conservator and, and my ideas on NFTs. Mm. So that's exactly uh, an example where we're just not there yet. Maybe, you know, in the coming months we will be. Yeah. But there are complex issues, like what happens if Ethereum doesn't exist anymore? Yeah, or when the software changes or things cannot be visualized anymore. I mean. Yeah, then it becomes, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know, yeah, how to, to do that. Yeah. Well, this is You're a great, this one yeah, out. no, this is a really great, uh, this is Jan Roberts' work, of course, that we just um, uh, heard about, but one, I think that this is an interesting conservation scenario in which, um, I mean, maybe you can even go one further to Machette. So I'll just introduce this first, but this is a website that we collected in 2016, and um, it's kind of a, a kind of choose your own adventure website where you can go to these different, um, like, uh, you know, a rabbit hole throughout this, and she's been making it since, I think, 1994, um, and updates it, I think, almost every day. Um, I think that Alno is going to click through a little bit to just show the dynamism of this website. Yeah. And so the idea is that it's actually made by a 13-year-old French girl who is, you know, thinking about the things, I guess, that 13-year-old French girls do. There's a lot of flowers and there's like ketchup on the flowers made to kind of look like menstrual blood. I mean, it's really a funny thing. And, and Martina Nadam herself, um, you know, she's been working on it for like 25 years now and, you know, she's not 13 anymore. Um, but to make a long story short, we acquired the archive of this work. So every update that she's ever made since 1994 and she um, also capped it at 2016. So it's a really specific version of, her, of the archive. There could be also a second version that we acquire. And then the way in which we install it at the Stadelik is, as Jan Robert said earlier, you have to make a version of that to make it kind of palatable to understand what it looks like in the exhibition space. Um, and then 
yeah, there was a photo of that, but that's okay. Um, and then what I was going to say about Jan Roberts' Skrullberg composition work, um, that is in the Stedelijk collection, um, acquired also together with Museum of the Image in 2016. And uh, Jan Roberts' approach to conservation is quite different from that of Martina Nadam. Um, Martina was like, okay, I want to do a research project over the course of three years to understand what it means to acquire this kind of work, which makes sense because it's an ongoing performance over the course of decades. With Jan Robert, he was just kind of like, um, well, my approach to conservation is quite simple because when it breaks, it's gone. It's also good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or gone. Yeah. <laughs> Your museum is called Next. Um, no collection, right? You do not, do you collect We've started. work that... Mm -hmm. We started. You started, yeah. yeah. Was that a big first. discussion? Should we do this, should we not? Are we just showing things? Yeah, for, for it has, the main focus for us was commission, is commissioning new works. Mm. Uh, so for the first exhibition, I think we commissioned 80% of the installations and the others we adapted um, and enhanced. And then for the new exhibition, I think 90% of the installations are new commissions. Mm -hmm. And then all of the uh, audio landscapes or soundscapes are also all new commissions. So for us, that's the primary focus for now um, because we want to give the opportunity for people to create new works. Mm -hmm. um, and then in line with that, for the last two years, we've been discussing how do we want to build a collection? Um, what does it mean to us to build a collection to all the points you're saying as well? Um, for example, do we want to build the research, collect the research? Um, is it about, is, is building the collection presenting and showing the work? Um, so for us, it's a much longer kind of research piece that we want to do. Um, and what we're mostly doing now is commissioning works and then having a license on those works, depending on who it is. Um, and then the works go back to the artists. How do you... Um how do you, uh, you're, you, you come, the, the, the place comes, your next comes to Amsterdam or it opens up, do you find a distinct place. Um, how was that received uh, as, a, as a new, yeah, a, a museum is coming, but it's different. Um, do you feel part of all the museums that are in, in Amsterdam? Uh, does it? Um, it depends who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, so, um, a few people said to us, a lot of people were very surprised as well because I've come from London and Middle, who's my business partner, who's Dutch, um, is not in the traditional art scene in Amsterdam. So a lot of people didn't know we were coming. And I think that scared quite a few people. They're like, how has this just happened? And none of us knew. Um, but it, we have been received really positively um, overall. And we're also building a lot of partnerships and programs with a lot of institutions that are here, be they public education programs or commissioning works together with existing institutions, um, and really looking at how can we all together come together to support the creation of new works. So for us, that's just always the focus. Yeah. The, the, um, you work with artists, uh, you commission work, uh, looking at uh, some of the works that you showed, but also there's this, um, yeah, there's feels, I, for me it feels sort of related to something, but I can't just figure it out. And so some of these things are, I've seen in my life before online. Uh, what, is, what is the biggest inspiration you think for artists? Is it, is it video games? Is it, uh, or is it everything? I mean, uh, uh, for me it relates to video games, it relates to comic figures. Um, yeah. I don't think there's one because the creators that we work with are all really varied. I think ultimately it all comes down to self-expression and storytelling. Mm -hmm. We've um, mythology and telling stories and finding ways to process trauma, create communities, come together. Um, what it is happening now is the same as what was happening in surrealism. The tools are just different. Yeah. Um, and we're focusing more on the more sophisticated tech tools or emerging tech tools that are being used. Um, but it really varies. It's, it's, yes, very much gaming, but in also some it's um, bio sculptures, um, it's um, AI. We did a big work with um, Algorithm Justice League that focused on artificial intelligence and looking at the biases, the uh, inherent biases of artificial intelligence. So there's also a lot of research projects we're also looking at yeah. as well. 
Karen, if you if you think about acquiring something, buying something, or get adding something to the collection, does that take a lot of discussion and explaining, or is it is it? I mean, the, a museum has painting, sculptures, uh, photography, um, yeah, and then then you come over and say, here's here's a performance, or here's a piece of digital art. Uh, it does is that a complicated discussion, or is that just as any other art uh, part of the discussion about uh, acquiring pieces uh, in general? Um, it depends on what it is and how much it costs and how much it costs to maintain it. Yeah. And then if, <laughs> if it's like a, a painting that's very simple, made out of like oil or acrylic with no, you know, that's very stable, that's, you know, a couple thousand euro, then that's one thing, if it's a you know performance that ha comes with a requirement to show it every three years and it costs ninety thousand euro to uh, display it, then that'll be more difficult. So we're much more selective about acquiring performance than we would be, say, painting. Yeah. Interesting to see. Uh, would be interesting to see these discussions taking place. And uh, are there, uh, do you any? Do you know people in the? in the art world that are totally against this, or they, they it's, for them it's like, this is ridiculous, or what are we doing here? Like acquiring performance? Right. Well, I think that a lot of people don't think it's possible, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's you mean, I, I've put hundreds of hours into documenting one performance just to make sure it's safeguarded for the future. And I think a lot of people would be like, you're crazy, like why are you bothering to do that? Just look at a video. Um, but, you know, I, I find it an extremely important art form that needs to be preserved for the future so yeah. that we know it won't just disappear if the artist were to pass away yeah. Yeah. or do something else and not perform it for a while. Yeah, it feels good to have that in the collection and safeguard it. Final question for you before I switch to our next uh, guest. Um, um, how often are you surprised? You commission something and something comes out of it and I mean, lots of people will be in the museum and they're like, I'm blown away or they, they are mesmerized. But how, if you're immersed in this world and you, you have this vision of uh, all these, uh, these presentations in the museum, do you still have these moments where you're like, I'm, I didn't see this one coming? Is that? Of course, yeah. every day. Every day? Every, I feel like every day I get to speak to some of the most intelligent um, progressive people that I have the privilege, I could ever have the privilege of meeting. Right. Um, in terms of installations, <laughs> there's, there's amazing surprises, but it's also technology, and there's also very shocking surprises. For example, with AI, mm. we've worked on installations or commissioned installations as part of research projects and the extent, for example, of the bias in AI. It's just an easy example to kind of um, easier example to bring up. That also shocks me from a fear point of view because AI is integrated in every single thing that we're doing. Um, but yes, also to see the speed at which um, these tools and technologies are evolving and also how complex the um, co-collaboration process is becoming as well for a lot of the creators. That surprises and amazes me because it's so many different ex experts from different fields we're working together to, yeah. Now we all want to have your job. <laughs> uh, but don't worry, we're not going to chase you out of your job. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm asking you back later on after we had the presentation of our next guest. And then we will involve also the audience. So hold on to your questions. I hope you have many of them. Um, Karen, Natasha, thank you very much. <laughs> our next guest uh, I met uh, recently uh, come to the stage, Alexei Yurenev, uh, when I did portfolio reviews at the Royal Academy in The Hague. And I sat across the table with Alexei and I thought, this is the kind of artist we need for our program tonight and I'm happy that you're here. You're a yeah. photographer, you call yourself a photographer, visual researcher and educator, working on the subjects of memory and the synthetic. You will show uh, undoubtedly some of these examples. Long-form documentary pro projects that have been featured in the New York Times, National Geographic, recognized by organizations as Photographers of the Year International. Um, 
you also started the, the photo platform, the platform, online platform for the Demic Org. We will talk about uh, trust and about what is real and what is not real. How important is it? You're currently based in Amsterdam, but you attend the Photography and Society Master at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague, working on projects looking at the role that technology and images play in the mediation of memory. You will do a presentation and then I'll ask you some questions after that. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Lars. Um, so, hi everyone. <laughs> um, I, I do call myself a photographer. There's a little typo. It said visual artist. I think that it's, uh, um, even though a lot of my work involves many mediums, this photography is definitely a starting point. And I think it's uh, uh, mainly in terms of its role in circulation and reproduction and not being so dependent on the aura of an image itself. I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore. And um, when I was 16, I moved to America. And now, I, 19 years later, I moved to Holland. I guess it makes my identity synthetic. Um, and when I, when I lived in America, I couldn't go back to Russia for 10 years because of the um, conscription in the army. And I was dodging a draft. And when I returned, I was really interested in differences from how I remembered the place and how I could no longer belong and what I kind of caught up, to, caught up on and what felt really foreign and, and kind of distorted and dislocated just like the memories that I had. And just to cure my own nostalgia, it was like it was around 2015 and Crimea was annexed and I traveled there to kind of seek these traces of traditions and memories that I've had um, in this place that's been uh, contested with its borders. And I looked at various traditions from school, um, like the school rituals, such as like the knowledge day, the first day when you go to school. Then I was looking at, uh, ran into um, this motorcycle gang called Night Wolves that was inspired by um, American motor gangs such as Hells Angels, but uh, took on the, the image of the, the gang, but then introduced these uh, the narratives and the rhetoric of um, World War II, Stalinism, and Orthodox Christianity. So this kind of mishmash synthetic identity that was kind of mixing and forming was really fascinating to me. When I came back to New York, I also looked into what does it mean to be an immigrant in the United States coming from the post-Soviet world that um, documented a community that also was interesting what kind of traditions and um, knowledge of the past you pack in your suitcase when you immigrate to another country. Uh, a few years later, I, it was around 2019, I, I, there's a little bit of an echo, if it's possible. Uh, two, yeah, two, three years later, I was um, decided to look into my own family history. And at that time, uh, I saw there was this whole development with artificial intelligence and especially in uh, models that are responsible for creating images and are responsible for deep fakes. And there was this one project out called This Person Doesn't Exist, which was this endless library of uh, synthetic portraits of humans that don't, they're not real. And looking through family albums, I found this photo and I, was, I realized that you know, my grandfather who passed away, who fought in the war, um, he never talks about it. And his memory of the war also doesn't exist anymore. And it kind of made me, it gave me, the pandemic gave me some time to um, learn new technology and kind of reflect on my own work and what does it mean and to, create, to be a photographer in the age of artificial intelligence. And I, con I conscripted this model uh, to try to imagine what could the war remember like for him. Uh, and the way this AI system works is uh, it's called GAN, Generative Adversarial Neural Network. It consists of two um, networks. One of them is called a critic and the other one is a forger. And the way it works, they both study a data set. Um, and the forger creates an image for the critic to be fooled. Once the critic is fooled and believes that the image is real, the image gets produced. And the more cycles, and they're, they're called epochs of learning, that, are, that happen, the more realistic the image is, comes out. So I had to sit through and look and crop and, and sort to about 35,000 images of the World War II, absorbing the violence of human civilization. I felt like it was a scene from uh, the movie Fifth Element, where Lee Lu is lo looking through this fast-moving slideshow of images, and uh, and sometimes you know I felt I've come desensitized to seeing violence, but then seeing just one image would make me 
uh, stop for the day. Um, and after many, many cycles of learning and hours of training, um, I got this result, which was pretty much referential for the amount of knowledge I had about my grandfather's involvement in World War II. Uh, it was just basically, you know, there's a collection of documents, a stack of photos, uh, but nothing really concrete, no chronologies. You know, interviewing my family was, I don't know if you've seen this movie, uh, Kurosawa's Rashomon, it's like when you have, you know, there's a murder and there's four witnesses and each one tells a completely different story with something of, out of that line, you know, and, um, and the, the whole fascination with memory too is that, the, you know, the, uh, the most truthful memory is the one you actually don't remember because every time you remember something, uh, you, you dislocate parts of it, you misremember, you can never put the, sh the book back on the same shelf that where it came from. So um, after training the model more and it became smarter, it started producing um, these bizarre images. And for me, they're, they become referential for the images that I personally digested along with the algorithm. And that's where I'm starting to question, am I training the algorithm or, or the algorithm is training me? And it's, uh, it's, it is a collaboration. And I'm looking at them and I'm, I, I am biased already because I saw so many images, but when I see them, I see war, I see a soldier, um, really similar to what I fed the machine. And then when to verify my own perception, I upload them into Google's API image recognition. And in fact, it did see war, violence, history, and soldier. Uh, for violence, it said about 80% likely. Um, so maybe the machine vision is just as subjective as human, maybe at least for now, or you know, just, and just as the memory that we think and we can trust that is our own, and it's true. Um, so simultaneously, you know, I started looking at different, like through the documents more, interviewing more of the family members, and comparing these images to, and trying to imagine, like, is this what the glory looks like? Is this, you know, what is this? Is it, what is it, how is it different? Is it more reliable than the images in the archive? Because in a way, you know, the machine is trained on th the 35,000 perspectives, but the archive, you know, re reveals probably just as much as much as it reveals, you know, it hides so much more. There's exclusive and more, and it's the structure of archive, and, and why there's so, so many gaps in it that should be investigated. And then there was a brother of my grandfather, Naum, who was conscripted a year before he, my grandfather was, which uh, I made my grandfather go to the army one year earlier to look for his brother. And uh, my whole childhood was basically, you know, first of all, I was, you know, born in, in the 80s. It felt like, you know, the war just ended two weeks ago, but then every holiday, you know, going to the monuments to the newly installed plaque with your grandparents and like, oh, where is, is their brother's name? He was missing for 80 years. And um, it was COVID and Ministry of Defense of Russia released, declassified all the archives relating to the World War II where, and made a public database where one can type in their relative's name and find out everything about them. Uh, there's scanned documents, maps, photographs, handwritten journals by the divisions. And I typed up my grandfather's name. I found all of this basically um, was swarmed with a deluge of data coming from knowing nothing to knowing more than it's possible. And then you know, I called my mother. I'm like, hey, mom, like I found this, all the, everything about my grandfather. And she was actually surprised and they didn't really care that much because everyone's already dead that I actually had cared. And, and then it hit me, I'm like, well, there's a brother, you know, I type his name and this document popped up and it said he died in a battle uh, outside of Stalingrad, which is now Volgograd, marked with a on a map, there's a, you know, almost a coordinate, a lot of description of the, what, what was going on. He was fighting for a, a strategic piece of railroad. So this winter, right before um, the, the current war with Ukraine started, I traveled to Volgograd to go look uh, for the place where um, my grandfather, my grand uncle was killed. And to my surprise, you know, I arrived there, I'm following World War II maps, I'm following satellite imagery, comparing the two, the information is not super reliable, but it's, it comes up and I find the railroad that he was fighting to protect. And then, um, you know, I came there with this giant rig, because I, mean, I, I wanted the real experience. I'm just like, I sat at the computer for two years learning how to train a model, you know, and it's, 
I was just like, I am a photographer and I want the real experience. I want to taste this snow and, you know, this light. And, um, and I packed this technical camera, which is an 8 by 10 It weighs about 20 kilos. And my, my grand, thinking of my grandfather, who was like a second person in artillery carrying a cannon, I was just like, this is a funny coincidence. Um, and then I, I realized I'm in this field, and it doesn't matter where I point it, it just looks like this. It's like nothing. And it's like I feel a complete void. And I get text messages from my family like, oh, are you feeling something? Like, is there, you know, there's, there must feel something. I'm like, I feel absolutely nothing. And <laughs> it's just like, it's a void. It's like a reflection of my inner self. I don't know. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, it didn't really matter. So it was just, you know, I shot this sheets and sheets of film. It's freezing cold. I got COVID at that point. It's like complete brain fog. Um, and, but then it's just like, I mean, it's producing these results, and then I'm looking um, at these images that I made, which are completely blank, and all they're just, you know, it's a deafening silence, you feel nothing, and then you look at the spectacular AI-produced images, that you, you know, it's a battle, it's epic, it's a, you know, there's a show, you know, and it's, but then I'm like, which one is more synthetic, because if this is, and, if this is 35,000 perspectives um, of some happenings turning into an event that produces kind of spectacle that are archived and saved and then retrained and you know there's role of the audience and etc., then this is two million perspectives buried under that snow that died in that battle. You know, so I mean, and then it's just which one is produced more. So which one is actually more reliable in transmitting this information? I mean, these are kind of questions that don't really have answers, but I'm trying to explore with this work. And, you know, and it, the work is continuing because I found more places of significance and kind of trying to understand my own relation to why am I, like, what is this search for to reclaim the truth, to understand myself from inside and understanding the role of memory. And, you know, maybe it's memory just never dies. It's either, you know, suspended in transit in these archives or maybe it's just like that Piranha named Masha in the lobby of an hotel in Volgograd, also dislocated. So the search goes on. I mean, this is this is just a, you know, this point the, pro, the pro, this project is in, is in progress. But uh, the next work I'm going to show you is um, it's also started from actually originally from my documentary work where throughout throughout this practice I always also always question the role of um, like how do, why do I have this right to represent someone and why can I what can I do to um, truly correspond and truly collaborate and truly create images together? And, and it, you know, the thing with AI, too, it's like it's such a nefarious technology, you know, used in this, you know, a lot of times to just eliminate humanity and, and to misinform and deep fakes. And it's like, how can we come up with this, this situationist approach and, like, turn it against itself? And it was like some, something really interesting to me about that. And I looked at, I visited a port in Rotterdam, um, and future, future Land, which is completely designed by AI for maximum efficiency. And it's like, I think something like 40 people work in the port and, and these ships, you know, there's the measuring, the units of measurement are just like Statues of Liberty and Empire State Buildings and Eiffel Towers and, and there's like 20 people in this place. And, and they call humans friction and the, the AI is uh, in the logistical system. So the AI is there to eliminate that friction. So I wanted to, to kind of talk about that through um, conscripting AI here to bring humanity back instead of eliminating it. So I remember that in my work in Ukraine, I met a seafarer named Yegor uh, from Nikolaev, and he, I, I engaged in the correspondence with him, and through like weeks and weeks of talking, and, um, I asked him to tell me stories. So he told me a story about this um, man on the, on the board who was a tank cleaner, and a seafarer, seafarer, is a, seafarer is a second most dangerous profession in the planet. It's something like one in, 72 die, one in 72 die at work, one in five suffers from depression, one in seven has suicidal ideation, and, and one in 17 deaths is suicide. So there's a lot of like mental health that's not talked about, and statistics are only kept by you know, Western uh, logistical companies. And, and back to the war, you know, being a uh, war... Uh, Shemek, who was worked with Igor, was a tank cleaner, which is like the most toxic job uh, on board. And basically one day he comes up to Igor, and Igor is a, is a cook, and he asks him for a sandwich for his daughter, who is 
uh, in his room, and Igor was groggy in the morning, made him a sandwich, and he's just, wait, there's nobody on the ship. He's like, how does he have a daughter? Tells the captain. The captain um, checks in on him. They realize they, there's some, you know, they, the guy's not okay, and eventually he gets taken off the ship. It's not a really eventful story, but I decide to see how I can use AI to uh, mediate the memory and the accounts, and what happens with the memory when the memory is retold many, many times. So after him telling me this story, I create a lineup of these men using generated, uh, a generator. And I ask him, none of these people actually exist. And I ask him, like, which man looks like the um, Shemek, the guy that, the tank cleaner. And Igor is like, well, you know, the, the bottom, bottom right is too old, the next one is too pretty, the top right is too, you know, not a sailor, and it's the top left, and he's a little fat, and the ear is too big. And I was like, okay, well, which room looks more like the room of uh, Shemek? You know, and he's like, well, the one on the right, but the beer cans are too visible, and the silhouette is not perfect, because oh, it looked like there was a person under the clothes, under the, under the blanket. Uh, there was a knife on the scene, which Captain hit him, like, which knife was on the scene? He was like, actually, it's none of them. It's a, it was a box cutter. So time goes by, and I call him back, and I ask him to tell me the story one more time. And I already uh, made corrections into, based on his previous descriptions, and I render more likenesses of that man, and he selects. He, the, the story changes a little bit, uh, not significantly, but there's, like, more details come up. So in this case, he chose another more accurate representation of Shamek. And then a funny thing happened. I re-photographed the room, and there was a, in, in, at this point, there was this third recollection. And then well, on all the third, three renditions of the story, there was a sandwich present in the room, and it was like a key element that he, there's a sandwich, he made it, he gave it to the guy, the guy brought it to the room, the captain saw the sandwich. And instead of a sandwich, I, I was kind of short on time, but you know, I, whatever I had in the kitchen, I threw it together recreated this scene, and I was like, well, I'll just leave it, see what happens. So he looks at this picture, and he's like, well, you know, Alexei, in fact, you know, there's, um, there's a strange thing in this picture. I'm like, what? He's like, there was no food in the room. So there's something happened with this mediation where it's like it starts altering memories, and it's like this is the power of imagery that you can potentially have in terms of mediation. And then we, we, we kept working on the collabor uh, collaborating, and sexuality is a really big subject, and shipping, as you can imagine, is, you know, man trapped on on a boat for many months, and he told, he told me a story about um, one of the sailors uh, who was drunk one time and told him to come in the room, and on the phone he showed him a, a pornographic scene on the phone involving his partner and, his, and the niece, you know. And he also, at that time, Sberbank, where Russian bank deployed this home suite of applications called Salut, it's similar to Siri, but it has, it had this really advanced imaging device called uh, DALI, which is uh, OpenAI's technology to create images from text. And I decided to play with that a little bit. And so I wrote threesome with Anise, and this, this is the images it rendered. And upon the like, second phone call I showed, I mean, they're, they're not showing anything. They're almost happening. They're latent. They're, they're kind of, I mean, all photography is latent because its meaning is latent. It's never really fully developed. It depends on circulation. But here it's, Really, the form is not, it's almost indexical, it's almost real, but it's, it's still distorted. They're referential, but they're not tangible. They're not, you can't call it a scene. So, but it was interesting in this conversation because he looked at them and he was, he told me, he's like, you know, Lexi, these are wrong. I'm like, why? He's like, well, you know, in these images, the, it's happening, but what I saw on the phone was about to happen. So it's interesting how we can use these generated and latent images to communicate something. They are, they are, in true definition, they are synthetic, as if they, are how they carry, their, it's a summary of observations that carry a psychological essence. They're more of a sculpture, they're more of a painting, they're not, they're liberating photography from not just its aura, but it's from its authority over authenticity and truth. And then throughout this collaboration, one day he, he was really reluctant of sending me pictures, actually the first image of the ship was his. And then finally he sends me pictures from the uh, from his work, um, and this is the last trip that he took. And he told me he was also, you know, was writing in sci-fi now. He's a really talented guy, and he told me he's like, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a working class, and it just this process realized me that I don't want to do this anymore. And he started delaying his following trips, and uh, he delayed and delayed until um, the war started. And 
Yeah, he said that is like I, I wanted to quit working in the sea, but then the sea quit me working in it. And uh, the current again, the correspondence ongoing. And um, yeah, this is one of the. Uh, is there sound? Uh, yeah, it's like the way we keep going on exchange, and it's kind of slowed down because now he moved locations. He's working for my staff. We're trying to figure out how to continue our collaboration. Um, and that's it. You, artificial intelligence and photography, you call, still call yourself a photographer. Yeah. You, that means that you open up uh, the classic notion of photography to what, you know, you bend it to your own position. Um, is that... Yeah, I think that, I mean, as I said before, it's just it's more of a, uh, it's a point of departure, you know, even the, the AI that I'm using, it's also, I mean, these are just, it's, it's all tools, you know, it's not, I mean, for me, photography is more about this latency, it's more about how the meaning is constantly evolving and developing, and that's a, the, the innate function of photography, mm -hmm. but, and I also believe that, you know, that's, there will be a narrative that will demand a more classical approach where I actually will go back in the field with the camera like I did before. You know, it's a, but I'm more comfortable with that identity. I think it's less, most harmless way to, to see what I do. Is that also what you tried to explore in your master in, in, in The Hague? I mean, they really opened up this beautiful realm where you go beyond photography, still being part of the photo department, I think, but yeah. Right, I mean, it's more, yeah, I think the key word in our program is society, and it's funny that actually, we're, we, our joke inside it, we've become masters of society. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's more about what the, what the image has, what kind of role the image plays in society. These days. Right. Now with the arrival of AI, with the new channels of distribution, with how we, we're not just, a, it's, it's, it is an operational medium, but it's not, we have to do much more than just to photograph, you know, so the, the act of photography doesn't add and that the click of a button or the developing of the picture. You know. mm. Is artificial intelligence uh, scary sometimes? Do you sometimes encounter things where you're like, ooh? Yeah, I think uh, to me these images are, you know, they affect me more than the archival stuff I see. I mean, it's a, there are like these weird Rorschachs, you know, that's one thing. The scary thing about the eye is that, you know, the language is really confusing because it's not really artificial at all, you know, it has like roots in extractivism and, you know, exploitation of labor and, you know, so many problems that we actually inherited from, it's not even repeating the history of photography, but even, you know, we're talking, not talking about 19th century, it's like 17th century at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and how, you know, and the huge question of surveillance, but I think that there is a way, again, again, it's like you, can we be, can we use it, a, to turn on strategy, can we be situationist about it? Can we flip it around to use it for something good? And I think there is a lot to do. Yeah. How are you perceived by, uh, let's say, more traditional working photographers? Do they do they relate to this? Do you ever have this discussion about, do they ever call you, how can you call yourself a photographer? Yeah, no, it's actually, I do have that uh, from some of my older teachers. I think there's a, the feedback is like, what is like, I like to see just, pick up a camera and go, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. but um, no, I think there's a lot of interest around it. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't know how they relate. I mean, it's not really of my concern at this point. <laughs> no. Just like, You want to have social impact with your work? That's, that's one of the things of course. you express. And, yeah. yeah, but how does that relate to this synthetic? Right, is, is that... How yes, you... in the synthetic way, I mean, I think, again, it's just like, for me, what's interesting is the perception part of it. It's how you, how, I mean, the rel reliability and, I mean, it's, in, in the project, for example, with Yegor, like, you know, for me, the most inspiring part was his correspondence and building together and him coming to the conclusion to quit working in the water. There's something about, and also about consulting a psychoanalyst throughout this process to make sure that I'm not causing damage with these memory experiments, but, and in fact, there's like a, what I'm doing there is, it, what is, what is practiced in, in treating trauma and psychoanalysis, you take away small elements to get to the, to the important part that you debrief later. So it's, it could be helpful. I'm questioning whether it's, these methodologies could be used in other disciplines, you know, and could photography be useful outside of publishing and, uh, you know, different, to mediate different kind of things, you know, not just 
the you know the physical reality, but yeah. more just to have effect. And again, and the impact and my social impact strategy is not necessarily for uh, change the world per se. You know, as a whole, it's like you know, can you do it one person at a time and be and create these relationships with people as well. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Jan, Robert, and Natasha, and uh, and Karen to come to the stage because then we can bring all together the the questions or the the interaction that we have. Thank you for taking that space. Um, any questions for coming out of artificial intelligence? Feel free. We have a microphone in the in the in the audience. Photographing the guest is also uh, allowed. Yeah. Um, we started with you, and and um, and and we we ended it somewhere at photography, uh, or beyond photography. Um, is there anything that you see tonight where you feel like, uh, yeah, this is again an eye opener? Uh, I, I never thought that this artificial intelligence in that way would be applicable, or anything that that caught your eye out of the the many stories that we shared. I, I'm, I'm pretty aware of what AI does, but it's always it's always about <coughs> the personal narrative, of course. So. Right. It's really interesting to see how he uh, sort of how he reads or feels certain emotions of a space which is yeah, latently there. It's so project based, uh, and there's, there's so much done in AI. And I'm, um, this is this is still kind of crude because it's very clearly semi abstract. I mean, AI is capable of really completely fooling you, so it's also, uh, that feel is so big. Yeah. It's so big. Yeah. Is that it makes total sense to, um, to see this extended photography. It doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not, I'm, I'm completely uh, <laughs> okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody has questions? We have a microphone. Didn't we cause enough confusion and uh, are we lost? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. That's okay. Um, we we have lots of uh, time after uh, this evening also to to talk to each other in the in the cafe downstairs. Um, isn't it a good thing that art is such a vast area, Karen? I mean, uh, it's it's your working space, and it's it almost feels that it becomes even bigger all the time. Uh, do you see that the same way? Yeah. I mean. Um I think that like within the museum, like un like we want to simultaneously be able to kind of categorize things and, you know, the kind of way in which we produce knowledge in a museum is pretty taxonomical. So it's like kind of going back to very long um, kind of pre-existing knowledge systems, which also itself can be sources of exclusion and sources of, uh, you know, major issues. But then you also want to offer an artist freedom to be able to do whatever they want. And sometimes that might be literally digging a hole in the gallery floor and filling it with dirt and letting worms uh, you know, run through it. And it's like, oh, but that's going to cause a problem for the other paintings in the room. Right. So yeah, there, yeah, it's like a balance of trying to find the freedom and also trying to find the structure, I think. Yeah. Is, is it an ex inclusive space, digital art? Are we, I mean, this is a big topic, big discussion, who is telling the story, who, do we feel, I mean, it, it has a lot to, who has access to technology, any thoughts on that? Inclusive for who? There you go, inclusive for who? Creators, the audience, the engagers. Right, yeah, from what perspective we talk, yeah. Yeah, I mean, technology is still very expensive. Right. And we're still massively lacking a lot of education. Um, in the realms of technology. Um, I think that's the interesting... There's a lot of conversations that there's more opportunities for a broader range of people mm -hmm. because there's less gatekeepers or there's many different ways to package it up. Um, that it's more decentralised, whatever else. Um, but you still have to have the understanding, the know-how and the tools. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So the answer leads a little bit to like there's a big question mark there. Yeah, at well, this moment. For me, it's a bigger question: Do we really, as a species, want equality? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
because then people have to give up powers. Yeah, and that's always difficult, it seems. Yeah. Do you see that the same way? Do you feel... I mean, you said it's a very, very small group, almost. I mean, do you know all of them? I mean, how, how, <laughs> how does that look? That was, that was in the 90s net art. I mean, the strange thing is that potentially both net art... That's why the work window was very much... It was like a commemoration of these two waves of internet art. Mm. They, they have so much similarities, and one of them is that it's... It, intrinsically a very accessible medium. Mm. It wasn't surprising that a lot of early net artists came from the Eastern Bloc and they, they saw it as a way of, a, of finding a very effective voice, a channel, um, because yeah, you have an old computer and find some internet and the, it, it, and, the, and the rest is free. I mean, HTML and all that, it's open source, so it's, it, it's very accessible. Um, that it was so small is that it was just a small community engaging with it. But um, it still was the 90s. Um, of course, a lot of the technology still was Western central, centralized and built on top of a Western art history and everything. Um, but the same now again with, of course, with, uh, with blockchain technology, it's, it's pretty much the same. I mean, you could intrinsically just take an image from a camera or from a phone and just mint it. Um, and there's, there's cheap blockchains where, you, where it doesn't cost you vast amounts of money. And it happens. I mean, there's millions and millions and millions of, of mints being done continuously. It's this, this ocean of, of NFTs nobody will ever see, probably. Um, so it's not, the accessibility isn't the problem, but it's always yeah. about- But then who makes the NFTs that are worth money? Pardon? But then who makes the NFTs that are worth money? And why are they worth money? It's, it's, that's it. It's about, it's about the, it's always about networks. It's always about gatekeepers, networks. Um, um, yeah, if you, if you make a painting at home, nobody will ever see it. It's always about that network. So make it that visible. Is, that is, that's where the question is. It's not the technology. Yeah. Uh, and it's not different as, as the world. So yeah. you want to make it accessible. That's, that's where you start. Mm -hmm. Do, do we think that uh, digital art and all these new, it goes at a lightning speed, does it rule, does it, um, it doesn't rule out any other art, but is it, is it minimizing other forms of art, paintings, or everything is still being done, but is it gaining territory, is it becoming more dominant? You, you work in contemporary art in, on a bigger scale from, but how do you, can you say anything about it, or is it too early? No, I think that this whole conversation is actually about markets. You know, I think that what we're th thinking about is how do we sell art and mm. how, do, how does digital art relate to that? Also, how do you sell experience? How do you sell museum experience? Um, I think that we both have a lot of thoughts and experience with that. Um, but, you know, when we were talking earlier about post-internet, this was an art form that, um, you know, was thinking about digital culture and then... Um, but it was expressed in an object. And this is also something young Robert and I have talked about, what it means to make internet art accessible in a gallery space. And that gives it this commodity status, mm -hmm. we would say, within the art world. Um, net art, which was you know, how Jan Robert started in the 90s, this was very anti-institutional and also anti-object. So mm -hmm. they didn't want to sell their work. But over the last, I would say, 10 years, a lot of these artists have warmed up to institutions. For example, Jody, a very, very important Dutch internet art duo, um, you know, they have sold their work to museums, for example. Um, but I think that within all of this, even with post-internet, where there are these kind of digital uh, culture-inspired objects, this was always kind of maybe even a little bit niche but with NFTs, what you're seeing is like something that's formless. Like this is the, I, the ideal of conceptual art, that there's no form for this object because it has no status. It can't be sold. It's not based on connoisseurship that you can say, oh, this is painted well. But then it's pure commodity, which I find super interesting. And Robert and I were talking about that a bit. 
that this is just in a way, I mean, of course there's like, you know, an, an idea behind it, but um, I find it really interesting that there's this relationship between formlessness and also the fact that it can be traded as a currency in a, in a way. Um, and the hype and like attention around NFTs has really carved a lot of space for itself, I think, in the art world and beyond. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know if you've noticed that, but I feel like my entire life has been taken over by being asked to be speak, speaking about NFTs and... Um, it will pass, yeah. You never know. You never I'm know. still talking about post-internet 10 years later, so... You wake up and say, today I'm going to look at paintings, not at NFTs. I've been trying, right? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Anybody is making paintings tonight, connect. Um, oh, yeah, just, yeah, just a quick example, because this is fascinating. Like, like this, um, there's a the niche within digital art is generative art. It's sort of abstract, generative, code-based procedural art. It's right. super niche. If you would be doing that five years or ten years ago, it was like nobody cared. And it was like a really tiny little niche of people who would be into that and hardly sold at all. And now it's like big, massive. There's right. like a whole generation of young people engaging with it, making it, talking about it, diving into the history of it. It's, it's never been that big. So these tectonic shifts are fascinating. It's like whatever happened, and if you talk to generative artists, over the last decades, they're like, what is this? <laughs> it's right. crazy. Right. But that's the internet, it does weird things. Yeah. I just wanted to comment on Karen, what Karen said about being formless. I mean, it is formless, but we also, again, speaking of traces, it's like we can't forget of the, the footprint it has. It has. It's not really formless at all. It's, uh, you know, you're talking about some calculations of, you know, carbon footprint from an NFT minted in an edition of 80 is equivalent to, what is it, 1,000 jumbo jet flights across Atlantic. It's like, is there a conversation to actually evolve to, when is the Ethereum 2.0 coming? You know, I think that's the, the things we should be questioning too. There's a commodity, it's very seductive to collect, but it's, uh, when, you know, there's, it's, the impact is pretty real. And it's like, we can't control how much renewables are being used to mint these things, to, to, to forge the blockchain, et cetera. You know, so it's, uh, it's an important conversation to have, I think. Yeah. It's an important, yeah, that's a really interesting comment, if I may respond. I think also um, what, where I was kind of coming from is this idea within conceptual art and contemporary art that the kind of utopian idea of an art, art object just can evade the commodity status by not having an object form. And even if you look at, for example, like, um, I don't know, like anything, like Eve Klein selling air, but it comes with a certificate, you know, like it's there's still some trace of a commodity. And I think that I don't think NFTs are like like conscientiously engaging that debate, but I think it's interesting to kind of pull that into how art thinks of itself in terms of its objecthood. Yeah. And I haven't heard a lot of people speaking about that with NFTs. Um, but of course, you're right that there's like this enormous footprint that they have, um, which also needs to be considered. If, if you speak about that, uh, you bring up the topic, we talked about it before. Do, do, do people really really relate to that or do they say, oh, come on, yeah, yeah, that's, that's just the way it is. I mean, is there any, is there, uh, um, is that a reason for some artists to say, I'm not going to engage in it? I think you yeah, should I'm, be I'm very really reluctant. Yeah, I'm really surprised because I've been having this conversation for over a year and that every time I bring it up in the NFT community, everyone's like, oh no, Ethereum 2.0 is coming, it's coming. Like the, the proof of, what is the proof of work? The other yeah. one, uh, the proof of stake, you know, so it's going to change everything. But it's, uh, it's been, and there's like, when is it coming? Next month. And it's been, you know, over a year. Memo Acton is one of the artists that has been like, you know, ringing that bell uh, for a while. And alarming everyone that this is this is dangerous, you know, this is serious. Mm -hmm. uh, but the response is really low because I think it's again, it's like who's the who's the stakeholder, who's the gatekeeper here? Like, what is it's who is controlling the controller? You know, like what is the what is this food chain that is created through NFTs that is so we completely are veiling the the impact, which is quite you know, it's geological, it's uh, and climate and everything else, you know. I, I, I hardly dare to ask the question, 
but lots of uh, showing digital art that takes energy, right? Yeah. Well, an, an email, an email is thirty-six grams of CO two. You know, so it's. <laughs> Say it again. One email is thirty-six grams of CO two. Oh, yeah. This is something I was going to mention as well on video calls. Um, Harm van den Doppel, who's also an NFT artist, he was saying once in a talk that I watched um, that. The, the good thing is this is opening up the conversation. It's often artists that are the ones that stimulate these conversations because the blockchain has been around for a long time and there's been many people in certain industries that have been making huge amounts of money off this for a very long time. And now what he's saying is, okay, so now there's a small percentage of that bigger pie. There's now artists that are finally able to utilize this and also mm. make some money from this. Now we're all kind of rearing up and arguing about this, but that's also a positive thing because mm. for the first time, the spotlight is also being put on this conversation right. because it is often the artists who bring to light the conversations that we need to have. Right, yeah. And we've worked with quite a few artists who don't want to engage with NFTs for the environmental footprint reasons. Mm -hmm. And there are also many that do, and they're also investing a lot of time into finding more sustainable ways to keep developing. Right. Lots of things that are connected to this digital world. I, I just trying to, before we, I'm going to try one more time if somebody has a question. Yes, yes, I can come off the stage. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to hand over the microphone. That's the rule of the moderator. I have such a long question. I have uh, one statement, two questions, and one other question. Okay. <clears throat> Begin with the statement. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the statement was about the energy consumption, which is for sure a very important conversation to have. Uh, tomorrow, the merge goes live on Ropestin's testnet in Ethereum. So that's the first step to the proof of stake, which will remove the burden of the crappy energy consumption of Ethereum. Uh, so this year, probably, but who knows. Uh, Kyle McDonald made a piece when he sells three NFTs for the total value of creating, buying carbon offsets to offset the whole Ethereum blockchain. Currently priced at $17 million to offset the whole energy consumption of all NFTs. Let's see if that works. Uh, <laughs> one technical question to Jan Robert Lichte, because the ornament work exists in two versions. One as a website and one as a hyper commodified NFT. <laughs> How do you deal with that? And is the ornament website already in a collection? Uh, wait, that was the first question. Second question. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, second question is for Karen mostly, but mostly the others too may respond. I was thinking in terms of, because you recently wrote a book after institutions. Yeah, I did. Which I did not read yet. So Bummer. I was hoping you could maybe pitch it in one <laughs> minute uh, with surrounding this question. So NFTs reshapes institutions in some sense, one can argue. Like last year, Artblocks.io, which is one NFT platform, had revenue of $1.2 billion. They're currently spending all their money on lobbying Congress for crypto laws favorable for crypto enthusiasts. One could argue they should spend their money on something else. But regardless, so there's an ongoing shift perhaps in the landscape of institutions. And I'm very interested in institutional critique, let's say. So I'm wondering what's your thoughts on that? Maybe if that's also addressed in your book. We Sup start with you. Okay, yeah, super. Thank, thanks for bringing that up. That's a nice plug for my book that's uh, titled After Institutions and published by Floating Opera Press now. Um, well, basically, my, my book stemmed from an exhibition that was canceled at the Stadelic, and um, I didn't want to let this research go. And I was looking at a bunch of different artists who were working in the vein of institutional critique, which was normally kind of seen as a genre from the 60s and 70s, coming out of conceptual art, thinking through the commodity status of the artwork, and of course, becoming formless. And I've been noticing a lot of artists working um, very kind of critically, thinking through museums and, and realizing like, hey, like we need to change museums urgently. Um, how are we going to do this? And then within my position as an institutional curator, I saw an enormous lack of funding and stability oftentimes in a lot of different museums. 
And so the book kind of tries to put together how can museums evolve to um, change and meet the kind of um, very good pressure that's being placed on them, um, but also become sustainable. And I'm looking at institutional critique and various new projects that are emerging. Um, honestly, it's a lot of object-based work. It's not a lot of digital work, but I think that one of the thoughts is, is looking at like economic models and, um, you know, if anyone wants to donate NFTs to the State Look Museum or the, the proceeds, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, no, so basically the book is just about, um, you know, trying to make sense of, of museums being in a very precarious place and then also needing to change at the same time. And how does that happen? Yeah. Thank you. Go, go get that book. <laughs> um, yeah, entrepreneurial thing. Um, the, the question, you, yeah. Do we need to go back or you still have it? No, 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 it's fine. Good. Um, uh, they're actually two different works. So the web page, the web piece is an animated piece. It is uh, JavaScript, HTML DOM, and the, the NFT is an on-chain assembled SVG, static. So they're quite different. But and they're just two uh, instances of a long series of ornaments of me making projections and uh, site-specific works. So that's okay. Another thing about the environmental point, because it is something I didn't sleep for for quite some nights, but <clears throat> engaged anyway, because it really changed my life. Um, I decided to to sort of carbon compensate it, sort of generously. Um, that was just a pragmatic choice I made myself to sort of at least to be able to sleep with this problem, um, which is also sort of. It's opened my eyes to a lot of non-compensation I do in other things, like driving cars or using electricity or eating food or anything. So it, it is, I think it is useful. Uh, I'm, I'm also quite astounded that that isn't standard practice in, in that world, because it is really a fraction of, of the money, and it, it could be so easy. But it also opens your eyes, like, why don't we do this all the time with everything, actually? Because it really is a piece of cake, if we would. Yeah. Good questions. I uh, yeah, I'm happy that you came forward. Anybody else dares to? There we go. Are there more questions? Because then after this one, I oh, suddenly you have all kinds of questions. No. No. no? <laughs> You're gonna hold it. Um, I'll try to see if I can if I can ask this. It was about um, how much importance digitally created work, uh, now I'll try the other way around. So for purely digitally created work, does it still have an importance in displaying it that it gets a physical space in comparison to it maybe being displayed purely virtually? Did that Is that a question for me? It's for the whole group, both as creators of digital works as well as displayers of it. Depends on the intention of the work. I think you're also saying with some of the earlier net artworks, they weren't, the intention wasn't for them to be in a gallery museum space. They were supposed to be kind of rebellious against that system. So it depends on the intention. But there's an, another um, growing, this is also an old fashioned notion, like there's this sort of virtual space and a real space. And it, it, it's, it's uh, we had um, the debate like uh, in real life and you didn't get your sort of other life, your second life. Um, also looking at from a, as, as phenomenon, as a phenomenology, phenomenal approach, uh, um, it's in the same realm. It's stuff coming through your senses, so it doesn't really matter. So, so it's, it's a more pragmatic thing. Do I want it to have it spatially hung up? Or do I sense it through my device or through my gear? Um, so I think more and more that, that we will see that as sort of one realm. And then the debate changes, I think. Add to it? Yeah. Um, 
I think I completely agree with what Natasha said earlier too. It's, it just depends on the intention and it depends on what are you trying. I mean, it also depends on the space as well. You know, it's like, what are you trying to convey? I think that everything should kind of be in correspondence, the artwork to the place, to the audience, to everything around it. It has, it's a one coordinated sort of dance. Uh, so definitely uh, all around. Question here? Question here. No. <laughs> Hi, I have a question to Alexei. So like you mentioned that you were uploading uh, these generated images to Google Lens, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. And it was like recognized as like something like um, uh, consistent violence, it, like probably 80%. And I was just wondering if you tried to check this, um, uh, like this kind of like the program, let's say, with other images in a way like maybe it's like this kind of like the, these two processes, they have like very similar lang language, which is just um, different from our languages. So that's why kind of like the this pro this processes they kind of they understand each other and they see see like what's there. And then I was just thinking, what uh, might happen if this image uh, would be let's say like painted with like paints and then photographed and then. Uh, upload it to Google Lens. Like, how would the system uh, recognize it? Yeah, thank you for this question. I mean, uh, I've done extensive experiments with Google's Google Cloud Vision, and it's uh, it actually we had we, at Photodemic we published this project. Uh, it's called Coronascope. Where during the pandemic, um, I was Ramin Mazur as the artist, and we, we did the back end coding for it and kind of the whole API part. And he photographed the screen with a magnifying glass, so the images were distorted. Of the, and the surge images were, uh, you know, pandemic, COVID, corona, etc. And so the images he photographed were a circle, and they were completely distorted. It's not a painting per se, but there was a distortion. And it was we did feed it back, so we created like a loop, like a feedback loop mechanism, where you could see, and it would zone. It still sees eyes like virus, things like that. So it's, it's pretty advanced, even though the, you know, in my case, I'm, you know, I'm not using, like my, my rig is not a Google rig, so it just creates, it's basically, it's not that they, it wrote the language so it knows what it made. It mostly works on shapes, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty accurate on, on feeling the essence. So it'd be, it'd be an interesting experiment to upload a painting and see what, I probably will say, first thing will say it's 100% painting. You know, and then it will find different emotions and uh, attributes to it that it will recognize. That's my, my assumption, but it's worth a try. I thoroughly enjoyed this evening, and I wish we could go on till uh, the metaverse. But we won't. Um, Alexei, Jan Robert, Natasha, Karen, thank you so much. Uh, there will be some space afterwards to, uh, to maybe engage and ask some questions. Um, for us, we will continue this series. We will be back on the 23rd of June, which will be visual storytelling. Yeah, we call it now war reporting or conflict photography. We don't know yet. Uh, we certainly will get some really wonderful guests in here as well. Um, what is real in these days of conflict? Um, keep an eye on the website of Pakhuis de Zwijger. Um, thank you very much for all being here. Thank you so much for sharing all these stories and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.